what our eyes see and where our feet go and what our hands <coughs> do. Richard Mao is also concerned with engagement between faith communities and between Christians and those who profess no faith at all. And this too has been important to me. I grew up uh, in both public, uh, educated public and Christian schools. Uh, I was in different faith communities, well, all Christian, but, but Reformed and Presbyterian communities, and evangelical communities. I went off to college and graduate school uh, in, in, again, a different sort of, sort of Reformed, evangelical, and ostensibly secular settings. You know, so for me, the Christian life in my scholarly engagement has always been engagement with people who didn't share my fundamental assumptions. And uh, it's been really important to me um, that the, the work that Mao has offered, because Richard Mao is keenly aware that living faithfully in this world, in God's kingdom that is now but not yet, <coughs> isn't really an easy task, as I think most of us know. And that there's a great responsibility of believers to be bold but loving, to be committed to our faith and theology, but to be humble, and to be evangelistic, but also open to learning from others. Richard Mao's long list of books. I haven't read them all. I've read some of them. I'd like to read them all. Um, a couple of my favorites are When the Kings Come Marching In and uh, He Shines in All That's Fair, although I have read more than just those two. Um, all of these books that I've read and many of his others provide sage insight into these kinds of matters of talking across faith and engaging culture. Richard Mao is an established scholar in Christian philosophy who has taught at Calvin College and Fuller Seminary, where he eventually became president. As the leader at Fuller, he has been hugely influential among evangelical and mainline Christians. He's equipped these people with the insights of reformed and reformational thinking, and he's encouraged them to keep one eye on God's word and the other on God's word while engaging everyone around them, both believers and unbelievers. So I look forward to hearing what Richard Mao has to share with us today. Please welcome him to the podium. Thank you, my lifelong friend, Paul. I appreciate that. It's great to be here. I, uh, it's good to be lecturing in a warm place. I, uh, last week I lectured in McMaster University in Ontario, Canada, and it was freezing, and then we came home for a few days, and then I went to, uh, the last three days I've been at Wheaton College in Illinois, and it's just wonderful to be at a place where you can actually keep the door open uh, to the outside. So, uh, and it's great to be here. Uh, I have followed the uh, progress of uh, Providence Christian College uh, carefully, and. I uh, greatly admire the school, and I'm honored to be here to give these lectures. Today, this morning, exegeting the cultures that shape us. In his book, uh, Water Buffalo Theology, the late Japanese-American theologian, Kosuke Koyama, reflected on his experience of being sent early in his career by his Japanese as a missionary to northern Thailand. Koyama had spent most of his life up to that point in urban settings, and he suddenly found himself in a rural region with many rice paddies. As he rode around the countryside on his motor scooter, he reported, he saw people whose lives involved many days of standing in shallow water alongside a water buffalo, and then Later days, those were followed by a, a period in which the people had to find some way of staying dry during the onslaught of the monsoon rains. How, Goyama asked himself, how do I bring the Christian message as good news to people who stand alongside a water buffalo on a rice paddy? And as he thought about this, he decided he was going to read the scriptures as if he were standing alongside of a water buffalo in a rice paddy. When he did so, passages and images that he had never noticed before suddenly leaped out at him, and he discovered that there is much in the Bible about water, about rain. God rules from a place above the rains and the floods. God stays dry. These themes came to loom large in Koyama's presentation of the gospel to the people of that region of northern Thailand. 
in generalizing on the method that he'd been using in these efforts to understand what the Bible has to say to the culture of the water buffalo. Koyama observed that the missionary must always be, be aware of being, and these are, this is his delightful phrase, of being sandwiched between Christ's saving reality and the other than myself reality of the neighbors to whom the gospel is being addressed. And this requires, Koyama argued, engaging in two kinds of exegesis, that is, two different ways of carefully interpreting what we're trying to understand. On the one hand, exegesis of the Word of God, an exegesis of the life and culture of the people among whom the missionary lives and works. This two-way exegesis allows the missionary to take the questions asked in a given cultural context to the enlightenment, these are his words, to the enlightenment and the judgment of the Word of God. Well, I like that sandwich between image. It's a nice way of picturing what all of us experience as Christians who live and work in specific cultural situations. How do we bring what we understand the Bible to be saying to us in its relationship to our cultural location? And I need to clarify at the outset what I'm going to be referring to in these lectures when I use the word culture. The word culture has the same root as cultivate. Thus, agriculture is the cultivation of the agros, the field. Horticulture is the cultivation of plants and so on. When we use the word culture to apply to human realities, we're referring to the ways in which we human beings cultivate patterns and processes that give meaning to our collective interactions, as well as, as the things that we grow as a result of those interactions. Culture is the basic stuff of collective human life. Language, entertainment, economic transactions, rituals, the patterns of family life, and much more. All of this is what shapes our daily lives and the lives of the people that we want to reach with the gospel. Many of us in the theological world have learned much on this subject from the great missionary theologian Leslie Newbigin, who served for many years as a missionary in India. When Newbigin returned to the British Isles after his retirement, he was shocked by the major cultural changes that had taken place there, as well as on the European continent and in North America. When he had begun his missionary career, he'd seen himself as being sent out from a Christian culture in the British Islands to the mission field. But now his own homeland was a mission field. Christians in the West, Newbegin observed, can no longer take a, the, a dominant Christian influence for granted. We are now post-Christendom. And the church today, wherever the church is called to serve the Lord, must see itself as a missionary church. To recognize that we now minister in a missionary context in our own culture is to open ourselves to learning from the kinds of missional efforts set forth by Kosuki Koyama. This requires, as I see it, the nurturing of a cultural empathy. This doesn't mean, of course, that in trying to understand a specific cultural context, we can simply take at face value the ways the people in that culture describe their needs. I noted earlier that Koyama's intention in advocating his two-way exegesis was to present the questions that emerge in a given culture to the Word of God for, as he puts it, enlightenment and judgment. We must identify the real nature of those needs by probing beneath the surface for the underlying God-implanted yearnings that give rise to what appears on the surface. There's an illustration that is regularly attributed to G.K. Chesterton that gets at this point in a very provocative manner. It goes like this. The man who knocks on the door of the house of prostitution is looking for God. I discovered recently that no one has been able to find that comment in Chesterton's writings, but that it does show up in a piece by a lesser, lesser known Catholic author. 
wherever the illustration actually comes from, it makes a profound point. Obviously, the statement shouldn't be taken as meaning that the man who approaches the house of prostitution hopes that God will be the one who greets him at the door. The real message is that people who are looking for ultimate fulfillment in the quest for sexual pleasure or wealth or power or any other element of, of, or aspect of creation will not find it in any of these things. The Westminster Shorter Catechism puts the point simply. Our chief end as human beings is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Nothing brings genuine, ultimate fulfillment to the human, to the human spirit except an obedient relationship with our Creator. When we think then about the experienced needs of unbelievers in our own day, it's important that we recognize that those needs, those quests and longings, are not wrong in themselves. To see this is to affirm a core truth in the so-called seeker-sensitive approach to worship. We need to begin with people's felt needs, but we must also acknowledge that these actual yearnings are often misdirected. People who are trapped in sinful lives are looking in the wrong places to find ultimate meaning and true satisfaction. Needless to say, the things that I've been saying here are not uncontroversial. There are many folks in the theological world these days who would express skepticism about my willingness to give some credence to uh, felt needs of our fellow human beings. They would insist that those human dispositions are deeply shaped by patterns of culture that are so profoundly misdirected that our only recourse as Christians is to call people to a conversion, a, a metanoia, a radical turning around in order to submit them to an alternative culture that fundamentally reshapes their desires and dispositions. The underlying questions here at stake here were addressed at length in H. Richard Niebuhr's 1961 book, Christ and Culture, where Niebuhr offered a five-fold typology that offers us some helpful handles in thinking about the relationship between Christian faith and cultural realities. His famous typology, Christ against culture, the Christ of culture, Christ above culture, Christ in culture and paradox, and Christ the transformer of culture. This typology depicts a spectrum of viewpoints regarding the assessment of our, our natural human yearnings. Does the basic Christian message stand over against those human yearnings in a sinful world? Does it give a kind of carte blanche endorsement to those yearnings? Does it see them as constituting a kind of experiential scaffolding for the gospel to build upon our felt hopes and fears? Is the gospel's relationship to those yearnings a paradoxical one, a standing in tension with our felt hopes and fears? Or does the gospel, the gospel begin with those yearnings in order to transform them? A couple of decades ago, I read a report about a poll that someone had conducted of faculty at evangelical colleges. One of the questions posed was about the books that most influence evangelical faculty's understanding of the integration of faith and yearning, learning. <laughs> yearning, too. <laughs> I wasn't surprised by the fact that H. Richard Niebuhr's Christ in Culture, published in 1951, topped the list. I've been visiting many Christian colleges as a guest speech, speaker and lecturer, and I've gotten a clear impression that it was difficult for a student to get through four years at a typical evangelical college without someplace along the line being exposed to Niebuhr's five Christ and culture categories. I've not seen the results of any more recent polls, but my strong hunch is that Niebuhr's influence is, is fading. There are a lot of reasons for that fading influence. They all can't be attributed, and, and the fading can't be contributed, however, simply to a, a combination of benign, benign neglect and, and changing theological foci. Niebuhr's book has been the subject of 
a sustained critique during the past two decades by some scholars who see his longtime influence as a regrettable fact. In my own efforts to understand the theological issues at stake in exploring these matters, I've been most helped by testing my own thoughts in interaction with defenders of the Anabaptist tradition. At the time of the Reformation, the question of what it means for a Christian to be a citizen of a nation and to engage in positive ways in the larger culture was the subject of passionate debates, especially between Calvinists and Anabaptists, and the debates have continued to our present day. You know, I, just, I gave a lecture last week at uh, the Pepperdine Law School uh, on Calvin and law. And uh, John Calvin said that the, uh, the calling of the civic ma civil magistrate is the, the most sacred of all callings, even higher than uh, pastoral ministry. Uh, that's a pretty strong endorsement of being involved in positive ways in, in the culture. Um, Anabaptist type themes have been given new life in recent years, particularly because of the influence of Stanley Auerbach a theological ethicist who very recently retired from the faculty at Duke University and whose writings have had considerable influence not only among evangelicals who are attracted to a strong Christocentric uh, perspective but also in the broader Christian community where many are disillusioned with liberal theology. Howard was following his Mennonite mentor John Howard Yoder refuses to accept any definition of properly formed cultural reality that is not grounded directly in the redemptive ministry of Jesus. The way of Jesus, he says, is the exclusive normative reference point for the moral life. And this means that the kingdom of Jesus Christ embodies economic, political, social norms that are so antithetical to the patterns of collective life in the larger human culture, that we Christians are required, in effect, to create an alternative culture. Thus, the Anabaptist type call for the formation of a kingdom community, living in separation from the practices of the, the larger community, exemplified, for example, in the Amish and the Hutterites, especially those practices that are closely aligned with the political assumptions of, of secular thought. This is a powerful perspective from which I've learned much. It certainly exposes the confusions that can result from a simple-minded application of Niebuhr's category. At first glance, one might be inclined, for example, to treat the Amish as a clear case of Christ against culture convictions. But one can plausibly argue that the Amish might be better thought of as creating an alternative culture. They certainly don't reject farming. Rather, they transform the typical patterns of farming. Nor do they reject technology as such, insisting instead on alternative technologies. The, the horse-drawn buggy is as much a piece of transportation technology as an SUV. Furthermore, the present-day Anabaptists and their fellow pilgrims are right to call us to account for the ways in which we often identify Christian discipleship with specific political programs and ideologies. The church's record in aligning itself with political power and in freely giving its blessing to various military campaigns, that record isn't a noble one. For all of that, though, I'm not ready to concede that the solution for Christian disciples is to abandon all efforts to employ the political means available to us as citizens as a way of pursuing Christian goals. Nor am I convinced that a thoroughgoing pacifism is mandated for Christian disciples. I'm not going to argue these matters at length here, but I can at least point out that while Leslie Newbegin, who was, as I've already noted, one of the leading thinkers in shaping the call today for a post-Christendom Christian witness in the West, that Newbegin refused simply to reject everything that was associated with the Christendom Constantinian arrangement. Here's what he says, quoting, Much has been written about the harm done to the cause of the gospel 
when Constantine accepted baptism, and it's not difficult to expatiate on this theme, but could any other choice have been made? The Constantinian arrangement emerged, Newbegin argued, in a time of spiritual crisis in the larger culture. And here's how he puts it. And people turned to the church as the one society that could hold a disintegrating world together. So what should the church have said in response, asked Newbegin? Should it simply, and I'm quoting him and paraphrasing him here, should it simply have refused the appeal and washed its hands of responsibility for the political order? This is not to ignore the ways in which Christians fell into the temptation of worldly power. But do we really think that the cause of the gospel would have been better served, and I'm quoting him directly now, if the church had refused all political responsibility, if there had never been a Christian Europe? Newbegin's own answer, I find it hard to think so. Note that in making that observation, Newbegin is referring specifically to the Christian acceptance of political responsibility in the larger culture. I'm convinced, however, that his point can plausibly be extended to a broader cultural arrangement. H. Richard Niebuhr certainly had a larger canvas in mind when he offered his understanding of the cultural arena. Culture, he insisted, is, and I'm quoting, the artificial secondary environment which man superimposes on the natural. I'll talk a little bit about this tonight, but uh, the whole idea that God puts human beings in a garden of raw nature, and then they begin to, to contribute things to the garden, which is really culture. Things like language, habits, ideas, beliefs, customs, social organization, artifacts, technical processes, and values. That's the artificial secondary environment, the cultural environment that human beings add to the raw nature of the garden. And once we expand our attention to this broader canvas, we move beyond simply arguing about such matters as violence and nonviolence, the nature of policy formation and the like, one of the items that Niebuhr includes in his depiction of culture, as I've just quoted, is language. Fundamental to our shared life as human beings is our capacity for communicating with each other by using words. Cultural interaction is facilitated by a shared vocabulary. How then do, do we view our patterns of communication with each other in the larger human community from a faith perspective? It's interesting that at one point in a book that he co-authored with Will Willimon, Stanley Hauerwas addressed the question of a common moral vocabulary in the public arena. How do we Christians talk in, in, in public when we're talking about issues of, of public policy? And he did so in a way that's suggesting that he was willing to follow his countercultural convictions to the point of questioning whether Christians, and he actually asked this question, whether we can even legitimately use terms like justice and peace when we're talking about issues of public policy. Because the assumption that Christians can assume a common core of meaning when we employ